Okay, thank you very much, everybody, for joining. Um, I guess this is quite an important uh, presentation that I'm doing. Um, because you can see, I've got the finish line of comrades in the background from quite a few years ago. And um, I know that uh, with a number of weeks to go, a lot of you have been training so hard, but now you want to try and make sure that you're prepared for race day. You want to make sure that your fueling is actually on uh, track. And hopefully um, that's what we'll be able to do in the session. Okay, I just want to wire that and up there. Just give me one second. Just going to raise this little thing over here. Okay, so before we actually get into the session, I think it's just quite important um, to chat a little bit about nutrition and how I'm going to uh, tackle the session. Uh, this session is going to be a little bit of education, not just, it's not going to be specifically product focused, although I will discuss some product. I am going to just focus on explaining how the physiology of the energy system works and try and give you an understanding of how you should be thinking about your nutrition as you get closer to race day. Uh, I know that probably all of you have done your long runs. There's not actually any very long runs coming through over the next couple of weeks. Uh, I know there are some people who are going to be doing some three hour runs this weekend, but there's not a lot of time to actually bed your nutrition down and test it over and over for race day. So if there is anything that you want to test, you've probably got a little bit of time uh, to test it over the next uh, uh, week or so, and then you're going to have to bed it down for race day. Uh, from my experience with comrades, I think it's actually quite important to mention that, that I've noticed over more than a decade I've been working with athletes from elite levels all the way down to amateur levels, and there's one thing for sure that definitely sets a good comrades apart um, from one person to the next, and that is definitely the approach to nutrition if you get it right you can have an amazing day out but if you get nutrition wrong it can really upset your day and unfortunately i've seen a lot of people that no matter how fit or fast they are they succumb to the ills of gastrointestinal distress dehydration lack of energy hitting the ward and it's not something that you want to happen on race day so i hope that tonight's session will be valuable and then i can shed some light if there are any questions that anybody wants to ask, um, I will give ample opportunity during the session to just, as I move between the slides, to give you an opportunity to ask some questions before I move on to another section. And uh, you can just unmute yourself and ask away, and hopefully I'll be able to respond quite quickly to those answers. And then if there's some of you that just want to mull over it and think about it before you ask questions, well, at the end of the presentation, I'll just drop an email address, you're welcome to email me, and uh, I will respond. Uh, unfortunately, it's not going to be a, 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 a like an hour turnaround. You've got to give me about 24 to 72 hours to respond to the emails because at the moment, I'm very inundated with nutrition questions. Um, and so I do a first in, first out approach, and yeah, it hasn't been uh, too easy. Okay, so let's get started. Okay, I think uh, first off, we, we're going to talk about the human fuel tank and I think it's actually very important to understand how this is going to ultimately determine how you're going to be fueling during comrades. So if we have a look at the the fuel tanks in the human body, there are two primary fuel tanks, the one being glycogen and the other one being fat, and these are natural energy stores. The glycogen tank you can see is probably limited to roughly around 2,000 calories, and your fat fuel tank is like greater than even 40,000 calories. And that's not, it has nothing to do with how much body fat an individual has. You can be six or seven percent body fat, you can still have 40,000 calories worth of fat fuel. Um, and the fuel in the fat tank is 
uh, adipose tissue, uh, free fatty acids, and obviously um, intramuscular triglycerides, which is fat that sits in the muscles as well, which is actually quite a, a primary fuel when it comes to endurance sport. The glycogen fuel tank consists of muscle glycogen and liver glycogen, uh, and that only gives you around 2,000 calories. And if you want to understand the fuel tanks in more detail, glycogen is actually your rocket fuel. It is that uh, fuel tank that under certain conditions, specifically high intensity conditions, that's the fuel tank that your body utilizes as a primary energy source. And when you are in a aerobic zone or a recovery zone, much lower zones of intensity, your body has a high ability to make fat its primary energy source. So both these fuel tanks are utilized under various conditions. Uh, it's not 100% one and 100% the other. It's basically a percentage of usage between the two of them. And in short, glycogen is your rocket fuel. Your fat tank is basically your diesel engine fuel, if you want to call it that. Okay, so I'm going to just explain to you from a zone point of view, and yes, there's many zones that people can exercise in or train in, um, depending also on the kind of zones that you utilize in your training structure. Uh, mostly the standard is around five zones, but you can get five A, B, and C. You can get seven zones, you can get six zones. It really depends on the kind of structure you put into place. And most of these zones are structured around maximum uh, uh, effort, uh, as far as percentage of maximum heart rate goes, uh, but like if you're looking at lactate thresholds and aerobic thresholds and anaerobic thresholds and VO2 max, um, these are you know probably within they fall within these kinds of zones. So if we look uh, at typical percentage of maximum heart rate zones, and we're looking at zone one up to zone five, you'll notice in zone one, uh, you're talking about 50 to 60% of maximum heart rate, and then 60 to 70 in zone two. And these are not uh, cast in stone, by the way. I mean, uh, you could actually modify these. I've seen some people move into zone two, upper zone two, at around 73 to 75%, even a little bit higher of maximum heart rate. It really is dependent on an individual. And I suppose laboratory testing and testing the threshold will give you an exact percentage. So these percentages are, by definition, they're pretty general. And it's very important to understand that. They're not 1,000% accurate. So zone one is what we know as the recovery zone. And if you have a look at the little circle in there, you'll notice that primarily the amount of fat uh, that can be utilized in that zone is around it's over 90%. A very small amount of glycogen is utilized. And then if you look in zone two, you'll notice the fat fuel tank is still the primary fuel tank. A very small amount of glycogen is utilized. But as we move into zone three, there's a combination of fat and carbohydrate burn. And that percentage can be a 55, 45, it can be a 60, 40. The percentage is a lot higher. It's close to an even split between the two. Still slightly in favor of fat. But zone three is what we call the glycolytic zone. In other words, you are going to be burning off carbohydrates when you hit that zone. And generally, a lot of runners, um, they don't necessarily do what we call polarized training, where they stick in zone one and two mostly, or zone two, and then training zone four and five. Based on the fact that a lot of runners running groups, we often see a lot of runners training primarily in zone three, which we know is not the most beneficial zone to train in. Um, but during racing, absolutely, zone three starts to become uh, quite a vital zone that they hit. Um, zone four and five are where your glycogen tanks are absolutely utilized nearly to the maximum. Zone five, absolutely to the maximum. And there's a, there's a reason for this. And the reason for this is that when it comes to utilizing fat and, to, and utilizing glycogen as an energy source, there's certain conditions that have to be met within the human body. The first condition is if you want to tap into the fat tank, you need oxygen. You need oxygen. Oxygen forms a very big part of the process of converting fat ultimately into a fuel source, which is then eventually taken up by the mitochondria and converted into adenosine triphosphate or ATP. And the same goes for um, 
uh, carbohydrates, which were actually converted eventually into glucose and then taken up by the mitochondria and then ultimately converted into ATP. But fat is a very long, slow process of conversion and a large amount of oxygen is required in order to be able to help with that conversion and process it into a fuel source. So what does this mean? In simple terms, it means that if you're running at a high intensity, your breathing is very heavy, you're puffing and panting, and the amount of oxygen that you're getting into the system is actually being shuffled straight to the muscles. It's very difficult to get enough oxygen in when you're performing at a high intensity to be able to perform a fat conversion into fuel. And, and, and that's exactly why it's very important, specifically if you are going for a faster training session or if you're going to do intervals, you need to know which fuel tank is being utilized for a session and how that fuel tank is going to be utilized in that particular session. So if you're doing zone one and zone two training, it's a very light, it's very light exercise. It's aerobic exercise. We call it aerobic because this, uh, oxygen is prevalent. And so there's plenty of oxygen in those zones. And ultimately, you can easily utilize fat as a primary fuel source. But as you move through the zones into zone 3.5, so your glycogen tank starts to become a fuel source and you start to deplete your carbohydrate stores. Now, those carbohydrate stores, as I showed you in the previous slide, are only roughly around 2,000 calories. So if you're performing at a fairly sort of moderate to intense effort, your glycogen stores are going to deplete, and that would probably be between 90 minutes and two hours of sort of hard exercise. If you're probably only sitting in zone two or three, you might be able to go two and a half hours, three hours, but the bottom line is, is the unlimited. And the only way you can actually spare glycogen is by consuming carbohydrates. You cannot spare glycogen any other way. You could train yourself to become more fat efficient, so you can burn off a slightly higher percentage of fat, and that's a slight percentage, when I say a slight elevation of being more fat efficient, being able to oxidize fat at slightly high intensities in order to spare glycogen, but it's not a indefinite glycogen spare. Again, it adds on some percentages. And so as your intensity comes up, it's going to be very difficult to be able to focus on, I'm just going to fat fuel. The best fat fueling zones are obviously zone one and two, and probably lo lower zone three, but, but once you hit those zones, you're all going to start needing carbohydrate fuel. Okay, now we're going to talk about how you fuel based on those zones. And, and, and if you have a look at this infographic that I put, if you're going in the aerobic zone, your fat tank is your primary fuel source, and you'll notice at the very bottom there it says low carbohydrate. And if there is a, a shift into more of an anaerobic area, you might be sitting in the middle, but as it shifts towards the anaerobic zones, you'll notice that your carbohydrate burn is actually getting a lot higher. So these two fuel tanks, it's like, in a way, it's like you're a hybrid vehicle. When you're going slow, you're turning electricity on, you're using an electric version of the vehicle, and when you're going fast, your fuel tank is switching off. You need to burn. And that's basically how it works. So what does that tell you? It tells you that you need to support the effort um, when you're consuming an energy source. And I'm talking now about an exogenous, which means from outside of the body in, consuming an energy source from the outside in. And that can be in the form of a carbohydrate. It can be in the form of a carbohydrate slash a little bit of protein. Um, and we'll talk about fat fueling, carbohydrate fueling, and protein fueling. Okay. Um, so if, do you still, do you, can you guys hear me? I saw one person saying that there's no sound. No. Just let me know in the chat even, if you can hear me. You're audible yes, from my side. Okay, great. All right, thank you very much. I just noticed somebody said they can't hear. Okay, so if we're looking at, 
at fuel tanks and how we should be fueling, if I look at zone one, you'll notice um, if I'm going for less than two hours of exercise, and this is again a rough estimation, it's not cast in stone, less than two hours of exercise, I'm very happy in zone one to go on only water. If I go greater than two hours, Remember, as you do more exercise over a longer period of time, you get what's called cardiac drift. Your heart rate does elevate because your body heats up. Your heart needs to divert more blood to the surface of the skin, uh, dilate the vessels, create that sweating effect, cool down the body. And so also um, that also is going to happen under even hotter conditions. As it goes longer, it could be in the morning, two hours it's possible, you might need to introduce some carbohydrate to support the effort. But zone one is very much, you could do it on an electrolyte drink and, and water, and you don't really need to focus so much on the fueling, you can focus on the recovery afterwards. If you look at zone two, you'll notice less than two hours, I've also put water, because again, if you're going in the zone and you're staying under two hours, you're not touching your glycogen stores really, you're actually only burning off mainly fat, so that could also be a faster training session. And then when it comes to zone three, now this is where the switch happens. You'll notice that less than two hours, yes, you could go with water if you want to try and push and make yourself a little bit more efficient, but as you start to hit more upper zone three areas in less than two hours, I would go with something that's definitely starting to introduce carbohydrates. When I say low carb, I'm talking about the maybe the amount of carbohydrates that you're consuming per hour. And we'll touch on that a little bit later. But low carb means you don't need a fortune, okay? There's, there's a little bit of carbohydrate to support the effort. And if you're going at a much higher effort, so you probably need a lot more carb carbs. And that, if you're going greater than two hours, you'll notice there, this is where I start to introduce more of, the, it's not a water session. Um, if you're going greater than two hours in zone three, it's now going low carb, high carb. When you go to zone four, there, in two hours, we start to introduce the carb. Great in two hours, we're starting to go high carbohydrate. Zone five, there's no such great in two hours. Most efforts are definitely way under two hours. And absolutely, you, you want to fuel these sessions. You want to fuel the efforts in these sessions. So what I'm trying to demonstrate here is that when you think about any training or racing, you've got to understand what effort you're going to be going at. And that effort could be power, it could be pace, but ultimately also your heart rate responds to effort and pace, and 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 what will happen is is that ultimately it's going to elevate, and the extent to which it elevates is going to ultimately determine how your energy system performs, and that's something that you need to know, especially when you're doing a big race like Comrades. You're going to be starting in very cold weather in Peter Maritzburg. Sometimes it's freezing, sometimes it's not, but it's still cold. You're going to go through dips, but I think about. 10, 15 Ks into the race, you're going to start to warm up and then eventually you're going to come further and further down the road. The sun's going to come up. You're going to start to warm up a little bit more. You're then going to start to hit some nice climbs. You're going to warm up even more. And so you're never going to really stick in one zone. You're going to start off and maybe build into it quite nicely and try and hold a very comfortable pace. Most people are going to try and hold a very comfortable pace, but there are times where you're going to have to push into other zones. And once you start pushing into those zones, you need to preempt and fuel for those efforts. Because if you don't, you are going to land up struggling much later on. It's a really long day for most people. And even for elite athletes, it's a very long day. It's, it's a very, very long day. Uh, even though they're running uh, five and a half hours, they're still running them at that one incredible pace. So when it comes to glycogen versus fats, the important distinction between the two is high intensity sessions deplete glycogen at a more rapid rate. In order to slow this down and preserve as much glycogen, so you want to try and spare your natural carbohydrate stores as much as possible, you need to consume carbohydrates during exercise. When you're doing lower to medium intensity sessions, you're going to burn a higher rate of fat to glycogen, and that means that fat is the predominant fuel, and you can actually take advantage of that. So you've got to decide what kind of a hybrid vehicle are you and what speed are you driving and which fuel tanks are you going to engage. And that will ultimately determine the kind of athlete that you are and how you should be doing. So I'm going to touch a little bit on this now because it's very important to understand how being fat efficient and being carbohydrate efficient work from a training point of view and from an adaption point of view. And 
I've got a nice little analogy that I'll talk about here. And that is the carb up, carb down theory. So if we have a look at most athletes, um, and I'm talking at an elite level, these athletes are what we determine to be very, very efficient at burning fat, but they're also extremely efficient at oxidizing carbohydrates. In other words, they also definitely use carbohydrates as, as an energy source. But they're very good at both of them because they know how to periodize their training. Um, if you've only been utilizing carbohydrates and only been training on carbs and you've, you've never done faster training and you also eat a very high carbohydrate diet, it's difficult for you to fast adapt because your body's used to utilizing glucose as a primary fuel source. And that is derived in, in the, you know, it's carbohydrates are broken down to glucose and that's your main source of fuel. And so the body will always get rid of glucose first. And so your body's ability to oxidize fat is much lower. So you've got lower fat oxidation when you intake, when your carbohydrate intake is higher. When you are uh, eating a low carb diet and you're doing a lot of faster training, then you've got a higher ability to oxidize fat, but now you've got a lower ability to oxidize carbohydrates. And a simple example is somebody trains faster, 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 and then they decide they're going to do some long session or a race, and they start to take gel, and now they start to suffer from gastrointestinal distress, which is digestive discomfort, because their body is not used to oxidizing carbohydrates. The digestive system is not there um, and trained to be able to oxidize carbohydrates and process them in a manner that makes it efficient to utilize. So it's very, very important to understand that if you're going to do one or the other, you need to have trained your gut. We call it gut training. And the only way to do it is to periodize your carbohydrate intake. In other words, on certain days when you're going zone one or zone two, you can do faster training. Um, if you want to then try and become more efficient at utilizing carbohydrates on race testing or tempo efforts, lactate threshold efforts, VO2 max efforts, hill repeats, speed work, track work, taking carbohydrates and adapt, 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 then absolutely um, you'll be able to. What is oxidation? Oxidation is the ability to take fat or carbohydrates. Uh, you oxidize, in other words, you utilize it, the body utilizes it and converts it into an energy source. Okay, it goes through a process of oxidation. So, that was just a question that I saw in the chat there. So, in simple terms, and I'll use an analogy on this, is you get somebody wanting to learn a new language and they can speak English, but they can't speak a language of, let's say, German, and they decide a lot of people go into this classroom, and they are now going to learn how to speak German. So the teacher starts with maybe nouns or pronouns, and then starts with verbs, and then starts with adjectives, and starts to create simple sentence structures, and eventually you start to put these sentences together, you start to speak the language, and over quite a long period of time, weeks, months, whatever, you start to become a little bit more conversive in speaking the language of German. Okay, that's wonderful. Now, all these people are conversing in German in the class, and then suddenly, the teacher walks in the one day, and she starts to speak to them in Spanish. And all of a sudden now, everybody does not understand what this teacher says. Now she's speaking a different language, and it's going right over their head. So... They've got to start from the beginning. They've got to start learning the pronouns, the verbs, the adjectives, nouns, etc. simple sentence structures, and so it goes on. And that's the process of learning a language. Until such time as they can now speak Spanish, and now they can speak Spanish and German. And your mitochondria, your body, your physiology is exactly the same. If you speak the language of fat, your body speaks the language of fat because you've been conversing in that language for so long. You're eating low carbohydrates, you're keeping it down all the time, you speak in the fat language, you're training mainly faster, you're training low carb, and what's happening is, is your body is adapted to a low carb environment. 
And if you suddenly go and you can't speak the language of carbohydrates, your body needs to learn that language from the beginning. And vice versa, if you speak the language of carbohydrates and you think that you're going to be fat efficient, then unfortunately, it's going to take you time. So elite athletes or most professional athletes, they periodize their training, they periodize their carb intake, they understand when they can train faster, when they need to train fuels, and, and this is exactly what they do on a daily basis in order to be able to come to become uh, efficient and uh, fluent in both the language of carbohydrates and fat. Okay, does that make sense? Are there any questions on that? Any questions at all? Uh, hello. Yes, hi. Yeah, you are speaking to Prince Mapumolo. Hi, Prince. Yes. Um, I, I'm sorry to, to join you later, guys. Maybe I'm asking a question that maybe you have covered. But when you talk of a uh, high cap, uh, roughly on your 32 GI uh, products, what are those high cap products? Uh, we're gonna get we, we're gonna get to that. It's not too early. <laughs> I've got some slides to talk about that, so don't worry, Prince. We're gonna get there now. Okay, thank you. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so so basically, when we're talking about um, faster training. Why should we do faster training? You can adapt to a high rate of fat oxidation during exercise, use it as a primary fuel source, but when should you be doing these sessions? Only light to moderate intensity, short to medium duration sessions. And if you're doing a long session, only if you are able to stick within those lower zones. Okay. When it comes to fueling for effort, carbohydrates equal better performance and recovery. There's absolutely no doubt the human body has natural fuel for many hours. And you can take advantage of those conditions, but when you want to put in an effort, then you need to be able to consume carbohydrates. Now, I was ketogenic. I was on a low-carb diet for two years, around 2013, 14, 15. And I've experimented a lot with being in a ketogenic state and then I reverted back to consuming carbohydrates. And to be quite honest, a lot of people have asked me over the years, which is better. And my answer to you is, if you want to perform, if you want to recover, if you want to become a better athlete, if you want to be faster, stronger, fitter, then you have to, in, you have to take on carbohydrates. You cannot not take on carbohydrates. And then they argue with me, and so this is only four scientific research studies that I'm going to put up. And if you look at these scientific research studies, you'll notice in 1983 with Finney et al., they did a four-week study. There was no difference in, during, in endurance capacity at low to moderate intensity on five subjects that want a ketogenic diet versus a mixed diet. But now this is low to moderate intensity. It's only 62 to 64% of VO2 max. Okay. So that doesn't really tell the true story. But if you go and look at studies like by Helge in 1996, there were smaller training adaptations after seven weeks of the high fat versus a high carbohydrate diet. So athletes that ate fat and low carb and those that ate higher carbohydrates, those that ate the higher fat, low carb, they adapted. And in other words, they progressed their training at a much slower rate than those that actually consumed carbohydrates. The carbohydrate group progressed at a much higher rate. They became faster and fitter and stronger over that period of time. And that's just seven weeks. When Fleming did a study in 2003, they reported small decrements in peak power output and endurance performance in the high fat diet group. So, and they, they weren't even ketogenic. They were just high fat, lower carb, not ketogenic. And they had decrements in peak power output. That means that their peak power dropped over time. And that's not something that you want. If you want to run up a hill or you want to do speed work on a track, you cannot have decrements in power. And then in 2014, there was a famous study by Zajac, and that, there they did a ketogenic diet, a mixed diet for four weeks in a crossover design. That was an off-road cyclist, but again, it's very much an endurance sport, and you can compare it to any other sport, even running. And they saw reductions in peak power were observed after ketogenic diet. So again, 
This tells you that carbohydrates are needed if you want to perform. If you just want to walk and jog and run and, you know, you want to just try and go low carb, whatever the reason is, um, then that's not going to allow you to perform and adapt and become a better athlete over time. So it's very important to have a look at some scientific research and, and to, to try and understand this. If you've got a medical condition, um, so if you are diabetic or you suffer from hypoglycemia, et cetera, it doesn't mean you have to cut carbohydrates completely. You've just got to be cognizant of the fact that the carbohydrates that you consume do not impact your blood sugar significantly and that you can man you maintain stability. And there's plenty of healthy carbohydrates out there in a natural form when combined with protein or fat, um, they don't impact uh, individuals with that are maybe pre-diabetic or diabetic or suffer from hypo or hypoglycemia as much as people think they do. And the best way to, and it's also, also portion controls is another thing. So sometimes we look at things like the GI index, but that's measured to a 50 gram serving of carbohydrates. However, you could take small portions of carbohydrates through the day, never elevate your blood sugar significantly, and you can actually cope with it quite well. I always advise uh, clients with blood sugar issues to utilize a blood glucose monitor, consume foods, make a diary, notification of it, um, and, and, and monitor and see how they impact you. Because one person can eat a banana, it does nothing to them. Another person can eat a banana and it elevates blood sugar. Each, each individual is unique. Okay, now that we've understand how the fuel tanks work and how fat and glycogen work and, and why carbohydrates are a necessity and when, when to fuel and how to fuel. Let's talk about um, actual fueling. Okay, and I mentioned before, carbohydrate fueling is basically um, needed for glycogen sparing, improved performance and better recovery. So let's have a look at sports nutrition requirements before and during and after exercise, okay? And this is how I break down the pillars. Before exercise, you need to decide, and this applies to races and training sessions, should I be having a pre-training meal? Should I be hydrating before my exercise session? And that really depends on a number of factors, and I'll discuss that soon. And then from a supplement point of view, should I, are there any supplements I could take that can help benefit me from a performance point of view, from a recovery point of view? Um, and, and, and these are, sorry, I don't know why I went back there. These are, are supplements that are known from a science point of view to have some evidence or research that proves that they do work in those particular categories, be it alanine acts as a buffer, nitrates can help with improved performance, bicarb acts as a buffer, creatine definitely the most proven supplement to improve strength and power. Um, I'm a big fan of creatine, even endurance athletes can utilize it in small doses. Caffeine is known to lower the rate of perceived effort, it definitely helps with mental focus and it definitely helps uh, um, reduce that uh, that feeling of uh, fatigue, helps people perform quite a bit. And then mineral loading has become quite common now in that if you can increase and maintain better fluid retention within the body to prevent dehydration, it can also play quite a large benefit when it comes to sports performance. During exercise, carbohydrate intake, protein intake, fluid intake, all of these need to be considered and that will depend on a number of factors. On the supplement side, again, caffeine, bicarb, electrolytes, those are the supplements that we're looking at. And then after exercise, carbohydrate intake, protein intake, fluid intake. So I'm not going to discuss this uh, recovery in detail, but when we look at an athlete recovering after an exercise session or race, we look at uh, rehydration. So fluid intake is primary. That's the first step, rehydration, carbohydrate intake, replenish the glycogen stores after you've had fluid intake. Um, and the reason you need to make sure that you aren't dehydrated is because if you are replenishing glycogen stores, one gram of uh, fluid is bound to three grams, uh, one gram of uh, carbohydrates is bound to three grams of water uh, in the glycogen tank. So, so basically, if you are dehydrated, you're not going to be able to top up your glycogen stores. And then after that, we look at protein intake because obviously you still need to resynthesize muscle protein, which is damaged during the course of the exercise. 
And those are mainly the three elements. We also look at the immune system recovery, but, but these are the basics. And then there are some supplements you could look at which might aid. I'm not, I'm not so sure about glutamine. The science has been four and against. It's not 100% evident, even though people swear by it. But to me, glutamine is better as an antiviral and it actually helps with, um, with alkalinity in the body. Uh, branch chain aminos, definitely. But now the science has moved towards essential amino acids. Uh, or EAs as we call them, and then electrolytes. Uh, absolutely key for post-exercise. Okay. So if I go now and I have a look at, I'm going to do a race or a training session, and I look at that before, during, and after filler, it's important to understand that there is a, a time of doing that session, and, and the time of doing that session is, is it early morning? Is it evening? Um, I believe that runners should be training mornings, sometimes afternoons and evenings, because comrades is a very long day. And you want to understand how the muscles and how that muscle fatigue works through the day. So if you're only training mornings and you finished within a couple of hours, maybe it's not beneficial enough. The real serious athletes sometimes do really like morning and sometimes afternoon sessions not every day but but some days people also work and they have families so the time of the session is important if you're going to wake up at 4 a.m um, and then you're going to have a meal but you want to get out the door it's very difficult to prepare a proper meal so you really do need to understand that the time of the session is going to ultimately determine from a convenience point of view what you should consume but if that session is long session or intense session, then you do need to make a point of trying to consume something before that session. Even if it's a, a banana, if you can make a porridge, et cetera. But the long runs on the weekends or, or any long runs that you're testing for comrades, you should be having a pre-training meal in order to be able to test it and see how you feel because you're going to be doing that on race day as well. Then you look at the intensity of the session. How intense is it? It's a very intense session, fuel the session. You get better performance and power numbers by giving yourself carbohydrates and caffeine as an example during an exercise session. If you're going to the track, take carbohydrates with you. If you fuel those sessions, you're gonna, you'll see, you save, you'll, you'll pull, you'll save seconds on, on maybe 400s, on 800s, on thousands, whatever you're doing, you will save seconds if you fuel the session properly. And if you save seconds, it means you managed to push harder. If you pushed harder, it means you did more muscle damage. If you did more muscle damage, it means that you're going to adapt a lot better once you've recovered from the session. Okay, uh, duration of the session, obviously, if it's short, fueling is not a major thing, but once you start going uh, for very long sessions, you do need to try and think about uh, the hydration and obviously the energy system, what you're going to be consuming. And then weather conditions are very important. Why? Because if you're going in cold weather, you're probably going to hydrate very little. You're going to lose more. You're going to lose less fluid. If you're going in very cold conditions, your body's a lot colder. And if you're going in very hot conditions or humid conditions, you're going to lose a lot more fluid in the form of sweat. So now you've got to think about, okay, I know what I want to eat, but now I'm also going to think from a hydration perspective, how am I going to hydrate for that session? And then you also need to think about when is my next session? Because if you're training in the morning, and then you're training in the afternoon, even though it's a short session or a non intense session in the morning, should you be fueling in that morning session so that you recovered properly for the afternoon session? So these are the main factors of what to take into consideration when it comes to sports nutrition. You need to think about, about these areas. Okay. Um, right. Let's look at practical fueling strategies. Okay, and this is where we start to get more down to the business of how to fuel. We're going to get more into a bit of product. So, like I mentioned, there's two main fuel sources when it comes to exercise, carbohydrates and fat. And then there's a secondary source, which is protein. Protein only comes into play under a uh, sort of a circumstances which we call gluconeogenesis. This is what happens when we start to deplete our glycogen and fat stores after many hours of exercise. The body will then look at other substrates, okay, to break down and utilize as a source of fuel, and this is protein. So it, it has the ability to cannibalize its own muscle protein, in other words, break down muscle, and then convert it into glucose and ultimately use that as a source of protein. What can that lead to? That can lead to the onset of muscle fatigue. So when I have athletes that are doing sessions that are four hours or longer, or very hard sessions over three to four hours, I would like them to consume a little bit of protein during those sessions. 
because ultimately it can help prevent those sort of symptoms that you would experience when you go through something like gluconeogenesis uh, where the muscles start to fatigue. It can help also stabilize your blood sugar and it can also uh, keep you satiated and keep, keep you feeling stable. It can also cut off a blood sugar spike as well. Well, those, those don't really happen during uh, bouts of exercise. Okay, let me go back here. Okay, this, this is an important slide. Okay, so now I get asked, how much should I be consuming during exercise? How, what should I be consuming during exercise? And first we've got to understand when it comes to carbohydrates, the amount of carbohydrates that we consume during exercise is really dependent on the kind of exercise we're doing. I spoke about low carbohydrate intake, sort of medium to high carb, and then you get really high carb intake, high carbohydrate intake. And sports nutrition guidelines are defined as between 30 to 60 grams of carbohydrate per an hour. Okay, 30 to 60 grams of carbohydrate per an hour is, is, is basically the standard. However, today, in today's time, athletes, when they're going on very, very long sessions, are even going up to 90 grams per an hour of carbohydrates, and some are going over the 100 gram mark even in order to be able to fuel the effort. I think that in most cases, the 60 gram per an hour mark is suitable to most people. Um, however, if you are going to be putting in an effort, if you are an elite or you're really uh, also quite heavy and you know that you're going to be utilizing a lot of energy to move yourself over quite a big distance, then you would probably want to go higher in that carbohydrate. And this is per an hour. So once you understand per an hour, how much you need, you need to stick to it. This slide comes from uh, my sports science, Esker Jukendrup, actually. Um, I'm just going to credit him because he's not mentioned in the slide, but this is his slide, and he is one of the uh, leading scientists around the globe when it comes to uh, sports nutrition. Uh, he's actually very, very knowledgeable in this space. Um, and he also developed the uh, glucose to fructose experiment where... They so if you're taking something like fructose, which is a fruit sugar, it, you, your body can only absorb around 30 grams per an hour. You limit it, that channel is limited to 30 grams per an hour. But glucose is limited to 60 grams per an hour. And then if you do a combination of glucose to fructose, like two to one, then you've got the ability to consume even up to 90 grams per an hour. Um, and that's what we call multiple transportable carbohydrates. So if you want to go more than 30 grams of an hour, you need to use a carbohydrate that is not a single source carb, that is a multi-source carbohydrate um, because they utilize different channels through the process of being broken down and then ultimately being converted into glucose and utilized as a source of energy. Okay, so if somebody says to me, I only have uh, sugar and water, well, you, there's a cutoff there. You're not going to get more than 60 grams of carbohydrates per an hour. It's impossible um, because of fruit, because sugar is a one-to-one -one glucose to fructose ratio. So you'd have to consume quite a large amount, and you're still probably going to have a, a huge limit. Um, and if you take glucose only, you limit it to 60 grams. If you take fructose only, you limit it to 30 grams. So by combining different carbohydrate sources together, You've got the ability to maximize your carbohydrate uptake and, and that will be utilized as a source of energy. Okay, how do you know how much you can take per an hour? It's not just as simple as I want to take 60 or 90 grams of carbohydrates per an hour. It, it doesn't work like that. Because you can put as many carbohydrates in your mouth as you want to. But the question you've got to ask is how is your body going to tolerate that amount of carbohydrates that you're taking in? Is it going to be able to cope with that amount of carbohydrates? And in some cases, yes, and in some cases, no. If, you're, if your gut is adapted to, to taking in 50 or 60 grams of carbs per an hour, um, you've tried it, you've tested it, you've done it uh, in long training runs and in intense training runs, and you've made sure that your stomach is fine and your energy levels are great, well, that's wonderful. And but if it's not fine, if you can't tolerate that amount, then you need to drop backwards. And 
that point of maximum carbohydrate intake to digestive comfort, in other words, not impacting the digestive system, causing stomach cramps or bloating, etc. That's what we call the tipping point. And you've got to train yourself to figure out what that tipping point is. It can take weeks, but you've got to test it and you've got to understand what that tipping point is. Um, I once started at about 35 to 40 grams when I uh, went to back to eating carbohydrates because my, my gut had to adapt. Um, and it took me a number of months to build myself up. I actually, at the moment, I am around 110 grams of carbohydrates per hour. I use a very specific product for that, which works. I've got a very sensitive stomach, but I can actually tolerate 110 grams of carbohydrate per hour, but I had to train myself to get there. It didn't take a week or two. It was a process over time, and, and that's now my tipping point. I'm going to see if I can even go higher. So it's important to test and try a certain amount, and then basically from there, you'll be able to see what works best for you. Uh, I'd rather be slightly under than over because once you're over, there's nothing you can do about it. You're going to suffer. If you're under, you're going to be depleted from an energy perspective. But we'll talk about that now as we get more into the nitty gritty. Okay. All right. Let's look at how you should be fueling from comrades from a perspective now. So now, so now I'm looking at what I can tolerate for an hour. And you'll notice here I put a fuel dispenser. A, to me, it doesn't matter what your fuel dispenser is. Are you carrying a, a money belt with gels in or chews in or bars in, whatever you're carrying? You need to know what those products are, how many carbohydrates or how many calories there are in every single one of those products. And you also need to know how you're going to split that up over an hour period. Okay, so you need to understand what your intake is. And if you look at what I've written on the screen there, you'll see there, um, I've got their low, medium, and high. Low is 30 grams of carbs. 30 grams of carbs is 120 calories. Um, and then you'll see I've got medium, which is 60 grams of carbs. That's around 240 calories. And then you'll see on the high end, which is on the far right hand side, it's 240 calories. That's 90 grams of carbohydrates per hour. Okay, but how did I get to that? So first of all, it's important to understand that you don't feed yourself once an hour. And people say, I'm going to feed myself every five kilometers or every two and a half kilometers or at a water table. And I'm like, but that doesn't really work because how long is it taking you to get to that water table? If you're going to go every third water table and it's going to take you 70 minutes to get there, you're going to be in trouble. Generally, I would recommend feeding every 20 to 40 minutes maximum, but the preferred feeding mechanism is on the 30 minutes. So you want to try and feed every 30 minutes because your energy system will be a lot more stable if you are feeding more regularly. If you create slight peaks and then you get these troughs where they drop down, it's hard for you to correct it if you're letting that feeding period go for far too long. Okay, so when I talk about a fuel dispenser, I just want to clarify, it could be gels, it could be bottles, you could have seconding tables, it could be chews, it could be a lot of things. It can be any kind of, of fuel source. You need to think about what you like. Do you enjoy liquid feeding? Do you enjoy solid feeding? Do you mind either? Do you want a potato? Do you want a banana? You know, these are things that you need to know. And then when are you going to consume those things? You, you need to measure the amount of calories you're going to take in. Um, and that obviously is the amount of carbohydrates. You, it's not a guessing game. If you're going to guess, you're going to get it wrong. And I'll talk about the pot of soup later. But so what I did was I took 30 grams here. And I've put there, if you're going to go with a, a, a 30 gram feed, you could take a 300 calorie product and you could break it down into one hour, two hour, three hours. You know, you can, you can break it down into, into like four hours. If you're going to go with a, a 60 gram feed, you can break it down into one hour. So what you would have had in two hours, you're now having in one hour. And if you're going with a 90 gram feed, what you had in one hour now, you're consuming in 40 minutes. 40 minutes. Okay, so the feeding frequency is smaller and you're going to be taking in a little bit more product. Okay, I think the next one is just quite important and it's probably the slide that you've actually all been waiting for is what does this mean 
what does this slide actually mean? It's a multi-hour system or drip feeding, but what does it mean from a from a fueling perspective? What does it mean in so I've got it in 32 G items? So what does it mean from a product perspective? And this is what it means from a product perspective. Okay. If I look at a, a like example, the race per energy bars, which are the new Nuva bars, if you're taking 30 grams per an hour, you'd have to have one every 50 minutes. 60 grams, you'd have to have one every 25 minutes. 90 grams, one every 17 minutes. Race Pro Gel, you'd need to have for 30 grams less than half every hour. You'd need to have a half a gel every 38 minutes. And if you want to have 90 grams, you'd have a gel every 50 minutes. Okay. Snap gels, again, 30 grams, one every 45 minutes. But if you're taking the normal snap gels and you want to go 60 grams, you need one every 22 minutes. I put a cross here for 90 grams. Why have I put a cross here? Because a snap gel is not a multiple transporter carbohydrate gel that's going to allow you to take 90 grams per an hour. If you want to take 90 grams per an hour, that is not the product to take. Unless you've tested it and your stomach handles it, but I would suggest going for something like a gel that is designed or a product that's designed to easily accommodate you with 90 grams. And we've got other products in the range that do that. You can see that the Race Pro Gel, Race Pro, and the Race Drink actually all support that. But if you're having a look at the Choose, you'll notice one bar an hour. I sometimes get people telling me they take one block every 20 minutes. So one block every 20 minutes is not a bar every hour. A bar every hour is two blocks every 30 minutes, okay? Uh, we want to go 60 grams. That's basically two bars an hour. It's one bar every 30 minutes. Okay, so it's very important to understand that. That bar is equivalent to two bananas. So if you want to use bananas as a fuel and you want to go 60 grams, well, that means that you need to eat two bananas every 30 minutes. So just understand that. You might need to eat four little potatoes every 30 minutes. So that's how important fueling is. It's not something that you can, you can guess with. It's something that you have to know how it works, utilize it, and stick to it. If you've got seconding tables or you've got the ability to run with a bottle, I mean, runners don't like to run with the bottles. Um, we launched the Race Pro Gel to take away the pain of carrying a, a bottle. Um, and they're very similar products, but the Race Pro Gel's really been designed for a runner. It's a resealable, you can open it, you can consume the whole thing at once or half of it or whatever you want and, and take it along, but it's better than actually going with a, with a, with a bottle and having these scoops. It's also less, it's less thick, it's actually already watered down and it's, it goes down quite a bit easily. And then another product that a lot of people, it's, I wouldn't say it's the, the biggest in our range, but the race drink is a multiple transporter carbohydrate drink and absolutely it's a race drink. It's, it, it does absorb. The only difference between the Race Drink and the Race Pro Drink is Race does not have any protein in, and the Race Pro and the Race Pro Gel and the Pro Energy Bar, they all contain a little bit of protein. And I prefer protein for, more, for endurance events because ultimately it does help stabilize, satiate, and prevent the onset of muscle fatigue. Okay, are there any questions here? Because I think this, this is the... <clears throat> there are some questions in the chat. Sorry, let me just run through a few of them quickly. Can one mix Race Pro and any protein? You don't have to add protein with Race Pro because Race Pro already contains protein. So you definitely, if you're taking Race Pro, you don't need more protein. Okay. Um, when you say what product is it to do... Um, 110 grams of carbs per an hour, I use the Race Pro Gel. It's the only product that's actually worked for me. Um, so the Race Pro product, I mean, I've done it with the drink, but the gel has been the product that's actually worked for me the most. Um, and it's very, very comfortable. So, um, if your goal is 11 hour, 45 for comrades, how often must I feed? Exactly the same, every 30 minutes, 20 to 40 minutes, you feed the same. Um, you got to ask yourself, in a normal day, what do you eat? Okay, in an eight-hour day, what kind of food do you eat? Now you're going to run for an entire day, even longer than the times you at work. Do you starve yourself at work? Do you sit the whole day in front of your computer, never drink, never eat? I'm sure you do eat, okay? 
if you don't eat, there's a problem because you can't focus because you do need cognitive function and without food, you're not going to be able to focus. So you do need to feed consistently. And if you feed consistently, you're going to stabilize yourself quite a bit. So it doesn't matter whether you're running a five-hour comrade or you're running a 10-hour comrade, five-and-a-half-hour comrade or a 10-hour comrade if you're a gold medalist or you're a silver medalist. It doesn't matter. Feed consistently, feed frequently. You just might need to take in different amounts. A guy running a five and a half hour comrade is going to take on a lot more fuel because he's burning matches. Those guys are running at one hell of a pace. The guy running a silver medal, he might get away with a bit less, uh, or he could go in with a high amount. A guy <coughs> running uh, even a, a much slower run could actually go in with a bit of a lower amount. The way I work this is generally I look at the body weight of an individual. And I would say that you should be consuming around 0 0.8 grams, 0 0.8 grams to 1.1 grams um, of your body weight in the form of carbohydrates or equivalent calories. If it's carbohydrates, there's protein. But so that means if you're weighing, um, uh, I'll just use 80 kilograms, 80 times 0.8, you would look at 64 grams. If you're weighing 80 kilos and you're running comrade, I would look at around 60, 60 to 5, 60, 65 grams of carbs per hour minimum. Okay, remember the bigger you are, the taller you are, the more muscular you are, the heavier you are, the more energy you're going to expend over the distance. The higher the impact, the harder you're going to work up the hills. Um, it's, just, it's just one of those physiological things. Um, Somebody's asked, can I take race pro and then take race strength? I wouldn't take one immediately. It says immediately follow with race strength. No, I wouldn't. I mean, if you take, if you're taking a, a, a remember, race pro gel is, it's a 300 calorie gel. 300 calories is, is, is 75 grams equivalent of carbs. It's like 70 grams of carbs and five grams of protein in there. So, so if you're taking that, um, you can't go take a race, race drink straight after that. It's just, it might overload the stomach. I would, I would split the feed. I would, I would split it. I wouldn't take it all at once in an hour. I would say at 30 minutes, I'll have half my gel. At the next 30 minutes, I'll have one to two scoops of race pro. Next 30 minutes, I'll take the gel. You know, you split the feed. Next 30 minutes, I'll have a bite of a banana. Next 30 minutes, I'll have a potato. Next 30 minutes, I'll go back to the gel. So, you can see what I'm doing. I'm selecting different product sources, but I'm maintaining a very, very stable and steady feed, and I'm not missing a feed. Okay. Um, I want to I want to carry on. I'm going to get back to these questions because the one came here and it's talking about hydration, and this is where we're going to go to next. So let, let's let's get to let's get to hydration because this is very very important. Um, Hydration and energy need to be separated. You, you can't go and say, I'm hydrating and I'm getting energy from a hydration drink. How much energy is in your hydration drink? And if there isn't, then how much hydration is in your energy, is in your energy product? So there are three types of uh, sort of products that you get. The one is called a isotonic solution. And that is diluted to, um, it's usually like a, a four to 6% uh, or actually 8% uh, dilution um, of carbohydrate to, to fluid. Um, and then you get a, a, a hypertonic drink, and that's H-Y-P-E-R, hypertonic drink. That is a concentrated solution. It's actually over 10%. And that is basically going to give you energy, but it's not going to give you hydration. And like a gel is a hypertonic solution in natural fact. Um, but that's why you need to drink water with it to help with the pull through. But if you look at a hypertonic solution, that's got no energy. That's only minerals. And it's really used for hydration. These are the things. So you've got to separate your energy and hydration. Hydration is calculated on temperature, conditions, and individual needs. Some people sweat more. Some people sweat less. But as the temperature climbs and as you get hotter, you're going to lose more fluid. Generally, it's very important to understand what your body would adapt to over time. Okay. And obviously, the more intense the exercise, the more fluid you lose. With 
an event like Comrades, it's very important to understand that most of the issues that I've seen with nausea and fatigue, it's not really been energy. It's actually been dehydration. And somebody says to me, but I drank a lot. And I'm like, but okay, you drank a lot, but what did you drink? And they say, no, I drank a lot of water. So you've got to understand that water on its own has a very low absorption rate compared to water with a carbohydrate and compared to water with a mineral solution. So like that sodium is in there. And if you can see in my hands, it's like a block sink or a block drain. The water sits and then like every 20 minutes, you might notice it's dropped a little bit. Exactly the same as the stomach. It like empties little by little over time. That's if you drink water. But if you go throw sodium in there, like salt and a little bit of sugar, it's going to, like, it's like, it's like, it's like a drain cleaner. It's going to pull it out a lot quicker. So I always advise people to, first of all, when you do drink from a water table, take it with salt or a cramp of salt or with a salt tablet or take hydrate, a mineral solution. But don't go and take just the water on its own. Take something with it to help pull the energy and to help pull the fluid in. It's very important because if you drink water, and it's not being absorbed, then you're not being hydrated. You're actually not being properly hydrated. So you might think you're drinking, but it's not being pulled into the system. And when that happens, you can actually feel your stomach feels bloated. You can actually, when you're running, you can feel this fluid sloshing around in your stomach. And if you, if the fluid is sloshing around in your stomach, then you should stop drinking and you should take on salt and maybe a little bit of uh, carbohydrates, but mainly salt, and try and get the fluid pulled out. Because if, if you can't get the fluid pulled out, you're going to battle. You really are going to battle. Eventually, you're going to get nauseous. And over-drinking fluid, by the way, over-drinking water can also lead to something which is called hyponatremia. It's not common, but it can happen. But it's when you dilute your blood sodium levels and you can actually cause swelling, swelling in the brain. It's not something that you want to happen. So when you drink water, drink it with a mineral. Try and get it in or drink an isotonic drink or drink a hypotonic drink, um, but don't go drink water on its own. Take it in with something. So I generally, when I'm going to feed, I'll try and feed. If, if I'm not going to hit a water table on time or I know water table is coming, I'll generally take on a gel or something before water table so that when I hit the table, I can actually take on the water and help get that gel nicely washed down, get the fluid pulled in with the gel. And if I need to, because it's too much of a distance, I'll take in some salt with it and try and pull that fluid out as quickly as possible. Okay. Um, just when it comes to soup creations, this is something that I really do want to speak about at Comrades. I've seen it with a lot of amateur runners specifically and first timers. They start to get very desperate for feeding. And so what they do is like, I met a guy once and he was first ultra a marathon and he says to me he he crossed the finish line and his blood sugar was elevated i said that's crazy if you cross the finish line of a race your blood sugar shouldn't be elevated you should be utilizing what you've been consuming and you shouldn't have such elevated blood sugar this is some maybe medical condition that he has but yeah. when he told me what he ate on route i actually figured it all out so and the guy was sick eh? he was throwing up for hours after but he basically started the race he had a big breakfast in the morning I think he had eggs and bacon on toast. So I don't recommend that as a pre-race meal, by the way. I'll talk about that later. But then he got to the start and he had three gels. And then he had nougat bars. Then he had jelly toast. Then he had a protein shake. Then he had uh, something else that was on route. Then he had a power. Then he had an energy gel. Then he had a Coke. Then he had another gel. Then he had a nougat bar. Then he had a, a, a jungle oats bar. Whatever he had, he mixed so many things together. I'm going to ask you guys, whoever's on here, ladies and gentlemen, if you make a soup in your kitchen, if it's a vegetable soup, you put water, you put vegetables, you put it on the stove, and you let it simmer. And that's how you make a vegetable soup. You don't go and add chicken to it now, and beef to it, and pup to it, and eggs to it, and coconut oil, and sunflower oil, and then go and throw in spices like curry and pepper and chilies and garlic. And it's not, a, it's not a vegetable soup anymore. You've created a soup and you've got no, if your stomach can handle that, 
then your stomach is made of absolute steel. But there's no way your stomach's going to handle a pot that is just mixed with so many different things. You need to keep your fueling very simple and very clean. In other words, stick to something that is simple and easy to use and stick with it the whole way. And trust that the amount of energy you're taking on an hourly basis is going to support you. When you start to create the soup because you're desperate and you start reaching for all these different products, that's when the dominoes come tumbling down and that's where we start to see problems happening because you would never normally do that during the day. I mean, it's like you're sitting at home and you're eating chicken and rice and then suddenly an hour later, you're eating Kit Kats, bar ones and every other thing you can possibly find and you're going over and over and you're eating and eating and eating out of desperation. Now your body's under stress and your digestive system is very sensitive. So you need to look after the digestive system by giving it small amounts that it can manage, that it can control, that it can break down, it can process, it can give you energy and keep you stable for the entire route. So keep the fueling as simple as possible. I would say that if you stick to one to two products, and I mean, I'm talking from an energy perspective, I'm not talking caffeine and I'm not talking about creme salt because those are got different purposes, but from a fueling perspective, if you stick to like one or two, maximum three products that you know, like a little bite of a banana or you've got a gel that you've utilized or you've got a drink that you've utilized, and you just keep those products that you've utilized and you stabilize yourself throughout, you, you're not going to go wrong. You'll start to go wrong when you mix a massive pot of soup, which is, turns out to be a creation that you just don't want to experiment with. Um, when it comes back to hydration, you cannot replenish the same amount of fluid that's been lost. You're going to finish comrades and you're going to be lighter. Every long run you've done, you've probably stood on the scan. You're like, oh, I lost five kilos. It's actually five liters of fluid you lost. That's your five kilograms. And that's how you work out how you can actually hydrate. You can replenish about 80% of fluid loss during an exercise session. You can't take in 100% because your body can't process it. And like I mentioned, the determining factors are temperature, duration, and also the weight of an individual. So you could weigh yourself before and after a training session to see how much sweat you've lost. The difficult thing with comrades is that you're starting in the cold, so your sweat loss is going to be little, but it's going to build up over time. So you're going to start consuming less fluid in the beginning, and as the day builds on, you're going to be consuming more fluid. But listen to your stomach. Make sure that you're not overloaded. If you are, remember what I said, take on salt, take on some carbohydrates, wait for that washing effect to, to disappear. Make sure that it's, um, that it's, uh, it's run out. And... Um, and that's the only way to, to actually control it. If you are, um, if you're feeding that sloshing, just give it some time, it will disappear. It's not going to be there forever. It could take 10, 15 minutes. Um, if you're taking some salt and a little bit of carbs, probably it will get, uh, you'll get back to a stable period a lot quicker. And then you can start to carry on hydrating properly after that. Okay. Um, I just want to talk about fueling with protein because during comrades, I know a lot of people like to stop and eat. Uh, I don't know. I've heard about peanut butter and honey. Peanut butter is more of a fat than a protein, by the way. So it's not really, um, it just helps with stability and, and that's it. The fat can help stabilize you. It's not the perfect fuel when it comes to these events. Um, fats, like I mentioned, are harder to break down and utilize as a source of fuel. Carbohydrates are very easily processed. But the protein, <clears throat> there are a lot of people that like to bite on like a stick of biltong or dried beef or whatever it is, and they say it works well for them. The reason they're saying it works well is because the reason they feel good in it is because there's a lot of salt in it, and it's the salt that's actually making them feel good. Because the salt, like I mentioned, helps pull the fluid, helps re with water retention, helps with blood, uh, plasma sodium levels, uh, that sodium to fluid balance in the body and it really does make a difference and it can also help just stabilize that hunger a little bit it's not going to be utilized as a source of energy it's not an efficient fuel source there's no way you can eat meat and say i ran my comrades on meat it's the best energy source there's no freaking way 
it takes hours and hours and hours to break down protein and convert it, not just through the digestive process. Protein gets broken in the digestive process over three hour period. And the human body can only break down like 10 grams an hour. So it's not exactly going to be utilized as a fuel source. Carbohydrates are a quick fuel source, but protein is not. So, so that is not the kind of fuel source that you'd be utilizing for comrades. And I just think it's very important for you to understand that um, carbohydrates are the best fuel source for, um, for this uh, event. Okay, let's talk about the week before race day. Okay, keep it clean. Um, when I say keep it clean, I mean, please don't go eat foods that could jeopardize your digestive system, your immune system, jeopardize your ability to sleep, jeopardize anything. From a recovery point of view, I've been looking at bloods of comrades runners after their long run, and it's not a pretty sight. I see a lot of runners that have got low red cell counts, low hematocrit levels, low hemoglobin levels, elevated muscle damage, CK levels through the roof, liver function issues. Everybody in their mind says, oh, I've done my long run, and now I'm going to keep doing and going to comrades. Let me tell you, when you look at bloods, they do not lie. What's happening in your brain and what's happening on your body is not the truth. What's happening inside the body is the actual truth. And some of the athletes that have shared blood with me, I've just said, listen, you shouldn't be training. Three days solid rest, four days solid rest, and then you need to ease back into it because most important is to actually recover. So it's very important that you focus on the recovery aspect in the paper week and you really do make sure that your training is structured to allow you to stay sharp, stay fit, but you know, get to the day still in great shape and not fatigue. Um, no alcohol. Alcohol dehydrates you. Alcohol prevents muscle protein synthesis. Alcohol prevents muscle recovery. It doesn't aid muscle recovery. The opposite. It doesn't allow muscle recovery. It doesn't allow glycogen replenishment. So you should really try and avoid it um, as much as possible. It's not a benefit. If you love your beer, drink alcohol free. Um, till after comrade. There's no reason to overeat now. As you tone down your volume of training, you need to make sure that you allow your calorie intake to fall in line. Because if you're eating in a calorie surplus and you're toning your, weight, your training volume down and you're eating in a calorie surplus now because you're eating the same amount when you were training, you're going to land up at race day heavier. And if you land up at race day heavier, even if it's a, if it's a kilogram, that's a lot. If it's half a kilo, it's a lot. Um, and when I say it's a lot, somebody says, how can it be a lot? Well, if you're running a cadence of, let's say it's a low cadence of 160 steps, that's 80 steps per minute on each foot, 80 times 500 grams of weight, half a kilo is what? 40 kilograms, 40 kilograms per minute, 60 times 40 is 2,400, 2.4 tons of force, more force on the body than you were used to in training. That's not desirable. Now add that up to 11 hours. That's an extra 22 tons of force. Can your body handle that? Well, maybe not. Maybe it'll break you, especially when you come down field to hill. So try and keep the eating nice and stable. Don't overdo it. And make sure that you are consuming a nice amount of protein every day. Eat your carbohydrates, eat your fruits, eat your vegetables. And just try and maintain some form of stability. Small meals frequently are the best way to go. Um, I'm not a fan of intermittent fasting, any of these things. And then the next important thing is make sure you hydrate every day. Really make sure that you're hydrating properly, um, that you're taking in fluid um, all the time. And then try and maximize your sleep. Why? Better recovery, stronger immune system less risk of illness, less risk of injury. Sleep is the key to help. So try and get to bed at a decent time and try and get in at least eight hours a night if you can. Uh, stay away from electronics. Don't consume stimulants like caffeine too close to bedtime and try and really get some good sleep. Comrades is once a year. You've trained so hard for it. Why put the race at risk and sacrifice these things? You want to get to the finish line with a smile on your face. Okay, let's talk about the three days before the event, leading up to the day before the event. Again, I'm going to stress, keep it clean. This is where you can also reduce your fiber intake. So as pre-race nerves start and as you want to focus more on the energy system, a lot of athletes actually suffer from fiber intolerance. I'm one of those that actually suffer from fiber intolerance. 
And so I reduce my fiber intake. So I don't eat things like rolled oats. I don't eat things like uh, basmati or brown rice or brown breads. I stick to more white breads, white rice. You know, the white carbohydrates, the ones that are easily broken down. And my fiber intake is very small. I still eat a little bit of vegetables for fiber, but I actually lower my fiber intake um, quite a bit. Uh, the day before, I absolutely drop it. Avoid any foods that you're intolerant to. So things like if you're lactose intolerant, to avoid dairy. If spicy foods don't agree with you, avoid them. If gluten doesn't agree with you, avoid it. All these kinds of foods you should avoid because you don't want to cause any digestive issues. And I've seen people with stomach bugs and stomach issues too close to comrades. It's just not desirable. Stick to foods that you would normally eat. I work at Expo every year, and the food hall is, man, guys sit there and they eat all the spicy Indian food and they drink a lot of beer. And maybe comrades for them is a joke, but ultimately it is a very big distance on a tarred road. It's high impact on the body and you really don't want to damage yourself. You want to really enjoy the run and get there to the finish with a smile on your face. So again, alcohol three days before, absolutely not. Avoid it. You can slightly up your carbohydrate intake. I'm not a fan of carb loading. It's not going to play a major benefit in a race of 8 to 10 or 12 hours. It's not going to, it's not going to play a major benefit. Your glycogen stores are 2,000 calories. So if you can get them up to 2,200 or 300, is that 300 calories going to make the difference between uh, big time? No, it's not because 300 calories gets burnt up in a very short space of time. You're burning about seven to 800 calories an hour probably while you're running. And if, if five or 10% of that is glycogen, well, I mean, think about it. You're burning 70, so it's going to give you an extra hour or two of, of, uh, of rocket fuel. But are you going to be using your rocket fuel? You probably only run the last kilometer into the stadium with a smile on your face if you've got the legs and run it fast. The guys that are racing at a very high level, they do proper carbo loading, but they deplete their glycogen stores completely before the race, and then they consume and build up their glycogen stores. There's a science to it. If you've never tried it before, then it's definitely not something that you want to test on race day. Um, okay, let's talk about hydration. I'm a big fan of mineral loading. So mineral loading for me is important. I actually take a bottle, I take two bottles of hydrate and I drink one, two bottles each day leading up to race day. Um, the reason I do that is to increase my mineral stores so that I can make, retain a little bit more water. And that sets my hydration status up significantly so that <clears throat> when I am doing a race, whether it's a run or it's an Ironman or whatever it is, the the human body is going to lose fluid at a much sort of at a slower rate than I would if I hadn't actually increased uh, my mineral status. So I'm a big fan of mineral loading. It works extremely well. And I would advise drinking a mineral drink because remember, like I said, water on its own doesn't get absorbed as quickly or as efficiently as drinking it with a, 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 a drinking a hypotonic solution. So I would say hydration is great. And if you want to drink three bottles a day of hydrate, that's also fine. Okay, focus on sleep. Specifically, the most important sleep night is actually the Friday night before Comrade. Because that's the last real opportunity you've got to, to, to really, really sleep. Because the night before, we all know we don't really sleep very well. Free race and earth. So let's talk about the 24 hours before. So what I say is sleep in later. I don't think there's a reason to get up so early in the morning. Delay for an hour, hour and a half, chill, relax. You can, if you want to do a leg loosener or a little run before the race, that's perfect. But this is the day that you really need to, it can make or break you. I wouldn't be walking around too much. I would try and freshen up my legs, rest them, get them up. A lot of the elite athletes, they do their runs and then they put their feet up the rest of the day. They want to try and be recovered, okay? <clears throat> no alcohol, no overeating. A lot of guys go and use pasta parties and eating tons of pastas and pastas the day before. It's not going to be a benefit to you. It's just going to make you feel uncomfortable, feel bloated, and it's not really going to benefit you. You can, again, you can mineral load. You can take in some hydrate. 
where I would look at increasing carbohydrate intake would probably be at lunchtime. And that's a good time to take it in. So why do I prefer lunchtime carb increase and not the night before for dinner? It's because at dinner time, you want to actually eat a smaller, medium-sized meal. You don't want to eat anything big. Why? Because if you overeat the dinner the night before, comrades, you're going to battle to sleep. Remember, your, if some people, they go down to the, I've seen them in hotels, they go down at 6 to 8 o'clock, they eat these big, they eat these big meals, and then they're just not able to fall asleep at night. They're feeling bloated. They're feeling uncomfortable. And the last thing you need to do is also you can't drink a lot of fluid before you go to sleep at night. So you really do need to focus on that. Don't worry about your energy system. Have I eaten enough carbohydrates the night before? Boy, comrades, is going to be terrible for me. I didn't get a good meal in. It's not going to be like that at all because the most important meal of the day is the pre-race meal, and that's on race day. You want to get a good night's sleep, you want to wake up in the morning, and you want to have your pre-race meal. I prefer eating my pre-race meal in my hotel room. I don't worry about going down. I will go down to the maybe for coffee and you know just <clears throat> see if I need to top up on anything, but I like to get my stomach working, so I have something hot to drink, uh, generally like a green tea or a coffee for me. A black coffee, and then I have my pre race meal. My pre race meal for me is, is already made. All I need is a kettle. I need some honey, some peanut butter, a little bit of banana, and it's done. I don't need anything else. So, um, with athletes over the years, I've actually, um, for a lot of, uh, depending on your culture, I've uh, got a lot of athletes that like to eat puff. I've got a lot of athletes that like to eat. I've, I've created a white rice pudding for them, and either of those is. Fine. There's some athletes that like to eat oatmeal. The problem with oats is it's got fiber, but if you enjoy oatmeal, I'm not stopping you eat it. So it's got a little bit of fiber, a fair amount, but it's it's not going to impact you significantly. Um, and then, so how how do you do? How do you construct the meal? The meal should be low in fiber. So puff is fine. White rice is fine. Oats is not ideal. White bread is also fine because it's low in fiber. And then you should have, it should be high in carbohydrates. So you could have two or three slices of white bread, even four if you want. Um, and the amount you take in depends on how far before the race you're going to be eating the meal. And I'll talk about that now. Um, and then it should have a little bit of protein and, and, and a little bit of fat, low fat. It doesn't have to have fat. In. Okay, so <clears throat> that's the perfect meal. If you want pap or rice, so what I suggest is you, you can even cook it the night before. You can put it in a container or a bowl, cover it in foil. You wake up the next morning, you can add a teaspoon of honey to it, a little bit of cinnamon to it. You can add some peanut butter, add some hot water, mix it in the bowl, and eat it like a porridge. You can actually eat it. It's actually, it's delicious. You can also do that with white rice. I overcook white rice, and, and basically I'll do it. If you don't like that and you just want to eat bananas, so eat two or three bananas, dip it in a little bit of peanut butter and eat it, and, and that's also fine. And, and when it comes to, um, oh, it's the same thing. Just make sure that you add in, you, know, you can add a little bit of honey, you can add a little bit of banana, a little bit of peanut butter. Make that meal count because that meal is going to set up your energy system for the race. That is the most important meal. If you skip your pre-race meal, you're on the back foot when you start coming. Absolutely on the back foot. You cannot skip it. People tell me I don't like to eat before a race. Nonsense. You have to eat before a race, especially a race of this size. This is huge. This is a 90-kilometer ultra. It is a massive race. Every single race you do, you should be having a free race meal. You need to eat that meal a minimum of two to two and a half hours before the start. But if you can eat it three hours, three and a half, Go four hours before, the meal can be much bigger. It's three hours before, slightly smaller, two hours before. Um, so the way I work it is like maybe between 300 and 400 calories if it's two, two and a half hours before, 500 to 600 calories. Um, and then if it's like four hours before, you can even go up to like 800, 900 calories or even more. <clears throat> so I don't, I don't use the white rice anymore. We, we actually... We developed a product called pre-race meal, which is a powder. You can make hot or cold, and you can just mix it 
in a bowl or you can make it as a shake and you can drink it or you can eat it as a porridge. And if you want, you can add in peanut butter and honey and banana or whatever you want and it actually tastes delicious. But I just find for me that we developed that because a lot of people travel, a lot of people are worried about food in a hotel or food here or there. So we decided that that's a very convenient way of just giving them a pre raised meal. And on the back of the tub, in actual fact, and it's also on our website if you want to go and have a look, but it tells you based on your weight and based on how long before you gain to race, how many calories you should be consuming. So you can actually use the table on there. Even if you're not going to use the product, you can go onto our website, have a look at the table, and also give you an idea of, of how much you should be consuming uh, for the race. Pre-race hydration. I do like to take on, again, I will mineral load. I'll take on hydrate, but I don't like to have a, I don't like to have a lot of water before the race because when the weather's cool, my bladder contracts and I'll end up running to the toilet a lot. And you don't need to stop and make a, a pee on the side of the road while you're racing. You want to try and actually start to focus on the race. And unfortunately, sometimes it just gets the better of us. But so I limit it. I make a concentrated solution of, uh, of uh, hydrate, like just in a, in a glass, 200 mils, and I drink that. And then after that, I maybe have a black coffee again, and that's it. I don't. I don't have more fluid, maybe a little bit of subsero there. And if you want to top up on the way to the race, if you're going from Durban to Peter Maritzburg and you want to top up a little bit, you can still actually take on a little bit more fuel inside the vehicle while you're traveling there or if you're going in a bus. Um, uh, and you can also just take on a little bit more. But listen to the body, see how you feel. There's no need to overload, but, but this meal is very important to set you up. A lot of people ask me about caffeine. I'm a big fan of caffeine. Obviously, you need to have tried and tested it. But caffeine, for me, it keeps me alert. It keeps me focused. Caffeine wakes me up. I don't consume a lot of caffeine in the weeks leading up to a race. But on race day, I take a lot of caffeine. And the most important thing you need to know about caffeine is caffeine reaches peak concentration levels within 60 minutes. So it will peak concentration level 60 minutes, and then it starts to drop. What does this mean? It means if you do take caffeine, you can't take it and stop taking it. Because you're going to hit it down. Once you start to take caffeine, you need to take it under an hour, every under an hour, because you don't want it to. So as, as you're going to peak and it's going to drop, you take the next one and the next one, the next one. You keep yourself topped up. You just don't want to take it. So you've got to decide, am I going to take it throughout the race? I'm going to take it only in the second half. I'm going to take it only in the last 20 kilometers. And then once you start to take it, then you take it. So... Um, for caffeine, I use the G-Shot. Um, I really do like it, and that's my go-to for caffeine. I take one every 30 minutes when I'm racing. Literally every 30 minutes, I take in a caffeine shot. Um, but I've adapted to that. I'm used to it. I enjoy it, um, and I like to race. Um, so it really is up to the individual, but it is something that you need to try. Um, during the race, um, I did see a mention of cramper salt um, in, in the question, and I absolutely am a fan of salt tablets. And if you don't have salt tablets, then cramper salt is an easy salt gel. Um, and it's, it's, it's got a very nice amount of sodium in it. And I just find it's just easy to take that and just snap it and take it along with water. And that works well. Um, all right, let me go through some of these questions, and then you know we can unmute you guys as well, and you can see. So... Um, so as, cramp, as far as cramper salt fits into the table, I just want to explain, it is not an energy product. So a very little amount of energy. In order to get 30 grams of carbs an hour, you need to take one cramper salt every 15 minutes. It's a lot. It's a lot. You can do it, but it's a headache. So I would just use it for hydration purposes, and I would take a cramper salt probably one an hour. Um, if it's really getting hot, you could take a cramper salt every 45 minutes, or you could reduce it. You can actually see how, how, how much how hot it is. And we don't know what the temperatures are going to be on the day. But I always like to carry something that's going to be a backup and that's going to prepare me. Is product a sufficient substitute for food? Um, or can one calorie count portions of food to take alongside product at some point in the race? So I'm a big fan of natural. And we try and keep products as natural as possible. The only difference between food and an energy product is an energy product is designed for a specific purpose and it's got a specific function. It's immeasurable. So I know that if I'm going to take a gel and it's 20 grams of carbs or 30 grams of carbs or 60 grams of carbs, I know that, um, I know that basically that there's, there's, there's that in the product. When it comes to food, 
you would have to measure. You would have to be able to measure how much content. How much is a half a banana, a full banana, a small banana, a medium banana, a large banana? Because you can utilize natural food on a course in conjunction with energy products. Absolutely, you can. As long as you understand the volume of what you're consuming and how it's going to fit into your overall fueling plan. And I think that that's very important to stress. So I know people that eat dates. How big is the medjool date? How much do you eat? And how many are you having for an hour? It's very important. Is it convenient to carry all these bananas and dates with me? Or the answer is probably no. So that's the thing with sports nutrition is more of a convenient carry. But if there are tables and route that have got these foods and you know how much to consume and when to consume it, then by all means do it. As long as you, in your mind, understand what that amount is uh, from an energy perspective and that it fits in there. Um, Tramper salt, I've, I've answered. So basically, I would take at least one an hour. Um, but if it's really hot and you're losing a lot of fluid and you really need to hydrate. Oh, and something I want to mention with hydration. And this was a very interesting um, observation that I had. I think it was the 2000 and it was 2016 or 2018. It was a down run. Um, there was a nice group of elite athletes running. It was Gif Kaleh, it was Bonga Musa, it was Ludwig Mamabolo, it was Rufus Foto. It was a really big group of, I think there were eight or nine elites running. And at that stage, with about 15, 16 kilometers to go to the Durban Stadium, Bonga Musa broke away from the bunch. And I was seconding Bonga Musa. Um, he was running for Nedbank that year. In actual fact, um, we were in the cars, in the cars, Nick Vesta. And what I noticed what Bonga Musa was doing was something very clever. He was very, he's a very, very smart runner. Let me tell you, these guys are smart. They're not just strong, they're smart. He must have taken 30 water sachets from us. 30 water sachets. Now, those sachets are about, I think they're about 200 mil sachets, 150 to 200 mil sachets. And of those 30 sachets, I made notes because I make notes of what every single person does on the road. I sit and I write. This is how much he consumed. This is how far he consumed it. This is how much fluid. This is how much energy. And that's how we look at things. And that's how you learn from them. But the thing that he did was he, out of those 30, maybe 35 sachets that he, he took from us, very little went into his mouth. Most of it went over his head, over his back, and he used it to cool himself. And that's very clever. Because if you took in all that water, you'd be in big trouble because it's not going to absorb. But what he did was he lowered his heart rate by cooling his core temperature, by pouring the water over himself. And that makes a massive difference. If you can bring your heart rate down by cooling yourself when it gets really hot, your body will thank you for that. I hear a lot of runners saying, oh, I don't want to wet my shoes. Forget your shoes. <laughs> you're wet anyway. You're sweating. Cool yourself from the outside. It works amazingly well. Over the head, over the back, a little bit around the core if you want. But it really does make a big difference. Okay, have that in mind. So if you're feeling over hot and you're feeling like thirsty, but you can't get the water down, sips of water, take on some salt, get it in, but cool yourself from the outside. It will make a big difference. A lot of athletes or runners, especially if they're newbies, they like to try and cool themselves on the insides by drinking cold water because it feels good. It goes in your mouth and it cools you. It goes down, but it, you can overload on the water. And it's not something that you want to do. I just thought I'd share that with you. I think it's quite important. Um, gel oh, banana sorry. potato. Yes, yes. Sorry to interrupt. I just wanted to ask a question around the um, hydration. So if you're saying you're looking at about, like, say, 65 grams of carbs per hour, um, what would you – I know you say it depends on conditions, but as a rule of thumb, um, how much – water would you intake just to make sure that the um that you're getting the right kind of hydration with that and then further to that with the hard with the hydrate tabs if you're doing those effervescents um would you take one every say like two hours or would you also base that on how you feel so uh, look for running i think the effervescents are hard because you've got to wait for those effervescents to to break down and dissolve. I mean, if you can walk with a cup and you wait for it, well, that's great. Assuming that's why we developed. 
route. Yeah, we we developed the cramp as as a as a hydrate as a, as a as a sort of a, a sister product to hydrate that you can carry and get in the same mineral as opposed to taking in the hydrate. If that makes sense, that it saves time and it's easy. Sure. Although some people maybe not like the taste, but uh, if you can, I would I would just I mean basically I would be taking a hydrate on an hourly basis. Um, I mean, I mean, from a tablet point of view, at least at least every hour I would be having one in a bottle. But at the and same then, time, I'd be having a cramp assault every 45 to 60 minutes as well, and that's the equivalent. So it's either one or the other. Um, on how much fluid you should be consuming with a product, so it depends on what product you're utilizing. So if I look at our Race Pro gel, there's, it's actually mixed with water. As an example, that gel's got water in it, and the amount of water in there is actually quite a nice amount. So you might only need 100 mils or 150 mils of fluid, which is a very small amount, after you've taken that gel into consume. But if you're taking a gel that's a very concentrated gel, and I'm not saying this to knock any other products, but if you're taking like a goo gel, which has got like no water and it's a very thick gel, you'd probably need closer to 280 to 300 milliliters of fluid to take on with that particular gel to make sure there's a pull through. And that's why you get these ISO gels and you get these gels that are concentrated. So for every time you take on food, I would say 150 to 200 milliliters of, of water on average. And I would say in the beginning though, um, and maybe this is something that I should mention as well. When you start comrades, you're not going to feed in the first 20 minutes. That's the whole idea of your pre-race meal and fueling before the start line. You actually want to, you want to give yourself 20 to 30, maybe 40 minutes to get into a rhythm, to feel comfortable. You know, that's the most important thing. And then you start to fuel. So you might only start fueling 30, 40 minutes in. Once you start, you keep going. Don't wait an hour to fuel. Definitely like that 30, 40 minutes you need to start. I know athletes are already feeling at 20 minutes, but, but, um, but in the beginning, because it's cold, I would, I would probably have, you know, you're pacing yourselves, you're not running hard, unless you're a rabbit, and you're not running fast, you're probably going to take on less carbohydrates and less fluid. Um, but as the temperature builds up, you're going to be taking on more fluid. So you might start with, I'm going to take on 200, or well, let's say 300 milliliters per an hour in the beginning. In the second hour, you might be going up to 350, 400 milliliters. And as you move, you know, maybe the, maybe it'll be 400 milliliters in the in the third, fourth, and fifth hour. But as you move to like hour six or seven, you might start no, like now I need five, six, seven hundred milliliters of fluid per an hour. Um, and 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 so it's going to keep going like that um, until you get to the finish. So the important thing is is that you can't drink large amounts at this, at once because the human body has only got the ability to process fluid over time. So the idea is to, when you take product, take fluid with the product, I'd say 150 to 200 mils, depending on what the product is. Um, and over and above that, I would say in between, like every 20 minutes or so, take on sips of fluid as well in order to make sure that you properly hydrate it. You don't have to take massive sips. The nice thing about drip feeding and, and drip, drip hydrating is that if you feel thirsty, you can take on a sip here or there. But if you're feeling like extremely thirsty and you're really like you haven't feel, you haven't taken on for a long time, I guess that's where you're going to land up in trouble, and it's very difficult to correct. But the more frequent you take on something, the easier it is to maintain a balance. You know, if you're if you if you overhydrate, you can say, okay, I'm not going to take on this for the next 20 minutes. I'll go 30 or 40 minutes, so you can maintain a balance. Or I'm feeling thirsty, so I'm going to shorten my fueling. I'm feeling hungry. I'm going to shorten my feeling from 40 minutes to 30 minutes or 30 minutes to 20 minutes. And I'm going to shorten my hydration from like 30 minutes to 20 minutes until I'm feeling stable again. So you, you've got the ability to play with the times of your feeding. But if you, if you leave it too long in between, I think that that's where you end up in trouble. So you know, you're right. It's difficult to like really pinpoint an exact science of like, this is how much you should be consuming. I can't say you take 200 milliliters every 15 minutes because you know, by the time you get to an hour, it's 800 milliliters, and that may be way too much for you at that particular hour of the day. So I hope that makes sense, you know, um, what I've said now. No, it definitely helps. Thank you. Okay. Um, 
you really have a problem with alcohol, Mark. I, I don't have a problem with alcohol. I have a problem with <laughs> it's drinking alcohol when there's a big event. Let me tell you, I've raced in Europe a lot. I've never been to a big race in Europe where they've had alcohol at the finish line. They've always had Erdinger alcohol free, especially in Germany. Every, most of the races have alcohol-free beer. And let me tell you, that's a good carbohydrate to recover. Save the alcohol for afterwards, the celebrations. Rehydrate, recover, and then go drink your glass of wine or your beer. Um, okay, it's just a comment on pre-race meal. Glad you like it. Um, can you still take Krampusalt when you've got hypertension? Won't it affect me? So, Toby, I mean, I, I, would, I would need to understand um, the level of hypertension that you've got. I think that's first and foremost important. But you, you do have to understand that when you sweat, you're not just losing fluid. You're losing minerals as well. You're losing salt. And, and so as you're losing minerals and as you're losing fluid, you do need to replenish minerals and you need to replenish fluid to you know to consume so you've got to see like what is your sweat rate if you're sweating profusely then yes you'll be fine to take on salt it's not going to affect your hypertension at all um i think the opposite if you sweat is sweat is actually hypertonic the amount of fluid that comes out can leave your your, your blood sodium a little bit more concentrated which can leave you in a more hypertense state so you need to take on more fluid so you've got to try and find this balance and I think it would be very important. Look, if you want, I mean, uh, you could take it up with your cardiologist and speak to them. But during exercise, I don't see an issue. I think during the day, increasing, so reducing sodium intake is a different story from a hypertension point of view. But during exercise, I don't see a problem with it. Um, somebody wrote they started caffeine usage um, at about halfway and two thirds into the race when the mind starts wondering to keep them alert. Uh, is it okay to start caffeine late in the race? Absolutely, it's okay to start caffeine late in the race. Absolutely perfect. Uh, a lot of people like to start it at the bottom of Fields Hill because that's where the real, the real tough stretch happens. Um, but when, it, when you do start it, just make sure you keep going on a frequent, uh, uh, you're taking it frequently. Um, is the lingering aftertaste of a gel anything? No, not at all. Uh, your palate becomes very sensitized um, over time, heat, temperature, etc. What tastes sweet always tastes sweeter. That's why I try and I don't like sweet too much. I like to try and keep the, the flavors toned down as much as possible because over time they do really get a little bit unbearable. That's why I also like to mix flavors and find things that you can mix and combine that make it easier. I don't like to stick to one flavor all the time. And so it's um it, it's it's it doesn't really mean anything. The the most important thing is not the taste of anything because that's just flavors or it could be, it could be a sweetener. Stevia, for example, has got an aftertaste if it's used in any product, um, but that's nothing to worry about. The only thing to worry about is how you're feeling, how your head's feeling. Um, you know, you're not dizzy, you're feeling stable, you're not feeling bloated, you're not cramping. These are the things that you need to look at. Um, why are scrambled eggs and no for breakfast? No bacon, just egg and toast. Um, it's not a no-no, but the, the, the eggs are not going to really, it depends on how many eggs you have. I mean, you can have scrambled eggs. Um, you could have two egg whites. I wouldn't even have the fat, actually. You can use a little bit of butter if you want as the fat, because it's not going to be a major energy source. Um, and if you're eating four hours before, maybe you could have three or four. But I would make it egg white, actually, which is a lean protein. But I wouldn't have it on a piece of toast. I'd have it on five slices of white bread because you want to get the carbohydrates in. So, so you really do need to make sure that the carbohydrate is the predominant part of the meal. And then the protein, which would be the egg or egg white, uh, would be off that. And then the, a little bit of fat. And that's the best way to do it. Um, I'm just... When it's come to analyzing the energy system and endurance athletes, it's not because I dislike it. There was a stage where I was ketogenic and I used to go low carb, high fat. But from a performance point of view, from an energy system point of view, carbohydrates are the king. They're absolutely the king. But again, don't go and overeat and do something that you haven't tried before. You know, you need to stick with what works for you. I had a guy the other day tell me he eats meat. Every time he races, he eats meat. I'm not going to stop him from eating meat now before he's raced because that's what he does. He asked me if it's a help, and I said, well, 
not really, because it's not going to break down and be utilized uh, for energy. Um, he says, but I feel good in it. I'm saying, well, then that's great. Could he perform better if he took a different meal? Maybe. I, I don't know, but it would be an interesting experiment. I just don't experiment with him now. Um, okay, are there any other questions? I'm just going to finalize with the slide quickly. I think this is just a rules of engagement slide, which I'd like to put up. Never arrive at a race, a match, whatever it is, without a planned nutrition strategy for the day. You really, really need to, to plan for it. You need to, I mean, I, you know what I should have put up here was Sean Micklejohn. I mean, he's amazing. He's such a good guy. But Sean Micklejohn's got more silver medals. And even at this age, in the 60s, he's still running silver medal times. It's unbelievable. So our 1995 Comrades winner sent me his feeding plan uh, for Comrades every year I've seen it. And the guy structured. He knows exactly what he's going to take at which seconding point and who's going to give it to him. And he's got the spreadsheet and every single thing on there is ticked off. As he goes to the race, he basically ticks off. He carries a bit of stuff in case he misses a second, but everything he does, he ticks off and he really absolutely sticks to his plan. But it's planned in advance. It's on a piece of paper. He's, he's got it in his mind. He knows exactly where to go. Um, you know, some people write down where their seconds are. Are they on the right side of the road? Or what are they wearing? What color exactly where they are? It's just, it's one of those things. You need to know a plan. You've got to have a plan and a strategy for when you go to Comrade. You can't go there and say, I'm just going to run. I'm going to guess. I'm going to try. I mean, what if you, I did a race once and I was relying on the water tables on route and the race started off and it was a 25k trail that we did and it was an out and back and I was expecting to take, I, I heard there was a water table at the 12k mark or, or, or 11k mark just before the turn and I thought I'm going to rely on that table for a feed. I asked them what's on the table, they told me, I was like, great, I'll just take something off the table and when I got to the table, they weren't set up for us. They didn't think we were going to come through there that early. They didn't bank on runners running at a certain speed. They were looking at their watches and they're thinking, oh, these things. So sometimes things just don't work out the way they should. And comrades, I've also noticed, your second is trying to get to a place on the road. And it's like, oh my gosh, the traffic, getting in, how do I get to the road? Panic, panic, panic. And then they can't get there. And then they go further down. We know the congestion there. So just make sure that you that you, you can rely on everything that you've got in route and that you've planned and in your mind, you've got a nutrition strategy for the day. And if, you, if you've got a plan for the day, you need to stick to it. You do need to test the stream training. So if you, if you haven't downpacked your nutrition plan yet, try some sessions now as you're leading to comrades with pre-training meal, with, uh, with uh, whatever you want to use. If it's a liquid feed, if it's a solid feed, if it's a bar feed, whatever it is, um, and just try it and see how you feel. Do it under various levels of intensity. Do it under interval sessions, hill repeats, tempo, whatever it is, uh, a longer, slower run, whatever it is. Try and test it and see how you feel. And then <clears throat> uh, start low and build high. So in other words, like you saw that tipping point. I think now it's too late to start trying to figure out what the tipping point is for your carbohydrate intake. If you haven't done it, play it safe. I wouldn't go over like a 70 gram. I suppose I wouldn't go over 70 grams. I would say it's safe um, if I'd never tried and tested it to see what my tipping point is. Take notice of what you're consuming during training, how you feel, various weather conditions, hydration. Try prehydrate, see how it feels, you know, before a running session um, and see if you, if you notice a difference. And take note of your energy levels before and out. Once you're satisfied, you can always test it out. Um, unfortunately, the long comrades runs have gone now, so it's not exactly ideal to test that on a long run. Um, but the long run will give you an idea of maybe where you lacked or where you felt good um, based on what was en route and, and what you took, and it will give you a, a nice idea. So that finishes the, the presentation. Um, if there are any questions, you can feel free to ask me now. The one thing that I did want to mention is if you still got questions, but you're not sure, you don't want to ask now, you, you're you more than welcome to, to email coach at 32gr.com. I've got access to that account. Um, <clears throat> there's quite a few nutrition questions that come in there, and I do respond on like a first-in, first-out basis. So, so absolutely, I'm more than willing to help. And 
I'm also going to be down at Comrades. I'll be at the Expo Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. So if you guys are running Comrades and you're down there, feel free to come in. And if you want to just bounce your nutrition plan off me and just double check that you've got everything in line for the big day, I'm more than happy to discuss it and, and help you. And if you see that I'm busy and I really do get busy at Expos, I promise you, if you just wait there or just allow, just say to me, I, I do want to talk to you, please. When you're finished, I will not forget about you. I will talk to you um, absolutely. So I've had people come and they've seen they're busy and then they walked away and they said, it's a pity I wanted to ask you questions. All you've got to do is, is make sure that you get my attention and it's fine. Am I running comrades? No, I'm not running comrades. <laughs> I uh, just came off an Ironman Middle Eastern Champs. Um, I podium there, actually. I qualified for World Championships in August this year. Um, unfortunately, this year is a difficult year. I lost my father in Jan end of January this year, and it's been a very tough year as a start. Um, I'm focusing on a marathon for next year. Um, so my training is definitely not at the level it should be for comrades. But ultra-distance races are really not my thing anymore. I'm getting old. I'm already in my 50s, and I'm finding it tougher and tougher to recover. And I've also got a lot of other things on the go at the moment. So it's difficult to put in that amount of training. So yeah, I'll be there. Um, I'll be there supporting. It's a goosebump race. I always tell people it's amazing. I have got some athletes that are coming from overseas to run comrades for the first time. So I'm actually quite excited to see how they feel on the route. I think it's going to be mind blowing for them. When I tell people overseas what an amazing race it is, they just can't believe it. But when they get there, they it's they just they blown away and they come back for more pain every single year. Okay, guys. So uh, I have recorded the session actually. Um, let's hope that it's recorded. Okay. Um, I'll get David to send it out. And by the way, anybody that was on this webinar um, that registered, we're going to send out. Well, David will send out a nice discount voucher that can be utilized as well. If you want to purchase any products, he's going to send out a discount code to everybody that attended. And, um, and yeah, uh, like I said, if there's any further information that you need, please don't be a stranger. Feel free to contact me. I just, for me, I do this because I'm passionate about people achieving um, and staying healthy. And I just love to share as much knowledge as possible. And I hope the session was of some value to you all. So thank you very much for joining. And uh, I wish you all a good evening and a good rest of your week. And uh, I hope to see you at Expo. Come and say hi, even if you don't need to chat. Come and say hello. Okay. All right, guys. All the best. I'm going to end it over there. Thanks, Mark.